What must we do to participate in the miracles of Jesus? That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 6. And we are continuing on with Luke 6. And what we're going to see is Jesus' compassion for people. We're going to piece together and tie this up in a bow, all these Sabbath messages that we have. Jesus was in the synagogue and teaching again, and there was a man who had a withered right hand. So they wanted to find a reason to accuse Jesus, and they're waiting for him to do it. And so he tells the man with the withered hand, come over here, you know, stand here. And so the guy gets up, and Jesus said to him, because he knows again their thoughts, is it lawful? to do good on the Sabbath, essentially, to save a life or even to destroy it. And so all they're just looking around because they don't know what to say. Jesus says, stretch out your hand. And the man did so, and it was restored, and everyone was angry about it. What I think was interesting about it is we see Jesus heal in so many different ways. We saw it in Mark as well, and we're going to see it more coming up. Jesus could just heal his hand by blinking at it. You know, he didn't have to even blink. He could just heal his hand. He could do it remotely. He could do it right there. But Jesus asked him to stretch out his hand. And so often in Jesus' miracles, in our lives, and in the lives of the Bible, he asks us to just make one motion of step towards him, to come one inch and participate in his miracle. You know, we'll see it in the Old Testament where Jesus has people gather your army, do this one thing, because Jesus wants us to be in part of his miracles. And in this case, he could have just healed this man's hand, but he said, stretch it out. Kind of makes you wonder, was this guy sort of tucking it into his cloak? He didn't want anyone to see his withered hand. He was embarrassed by it. And Jesus wanted him to haul it out in the middle of everyone do this small thing to participate in this miracle so everyone could see it. There used to be this old story that I read when I was part of InterVarsity. I think it was one of their pamphlet booklets. And it talked about a girl who was crying because her toy was broken and she just wanted her parents to fix the toy. But she gripped it so tightly that her parents couldn't get it away from her to fix. And that it was an analogy that when we hurt sometimes, we grip that thing so hard, hold it so close to ourselves that we don't give it to God to be fixed. And I think that's what's happening with this man's hand. Now we have all 12 of the apostles. We didn't hear their other stories like we have heard in mostly Matthew, but we had, again, Simon, his brother Andrew, James and John, the other two fishermen, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, it was Levi, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So we have the same names. So in this case, we call him Judas, but Mark called him Thaddeus, and we think it was because no one wants to be called Judas after we find out what Judas does. In this case, we hear his name, Judas, who was the son of James. Two Judases. We should not get them confused. It also says, you know, at the beginning of the calling, that they went up to the mountain to pray. And all night, he continued to pray for God. And when the day came, he called his disciples and chose 12 from them. So again, keep in mind, the disciples are going to be many, many people, while the apostles are 12. So he picked from that group of people who were following him. We see Luke focusing on Jesus getting alone and praying. He healed a lot of people. The crowd was there. He ends up going out of Judea and goes to the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. This would be north of where we think of Israel today along the coast. But it was part of the initial 12 tribes land. But now it was considered to be a part of Phoenicia, which we'll see the Canaanite woman or the Phoenician woman who talks about eating with the dogs. But it's the same area that is that particular story was in. And he was healing people, too. And, you know, people who had spirits were cured of their spirits. And, of course, the crowd keeps coming to him. And it said they sought to touch him, for the power came out of him and healed them all. Jesus doesn't heal people because they touched him. 
I think what we see in this is that the word starts getting out. If you just touch his cloak, if you just touch his leg, if you could just reach part of him. But instead, it's, I think, that reaching out to God and God responding. There's nothing magical about his cloak. There's nothing magical about touching him. It is that desire to reach out to God. And that's what heals them. It's their faith. You know, we'll see in that poor woman who her faith had made her well. And we have the Beatitudes. Now, what's interesting is it said that, you know, that this is a different location. Before we were on top of a mountain in this area, this was an, another area. But there's no idea that Jesus only said everything once. Of course, Jesus would have said the similar things in other places because we would have all wanted to hear the Beatitudes, the blessed are. We would want other areas and other places to hear about it. So, of course, this is going to be said many times and someone jokingly, or maybe not jokingly, but called it Sermon on the Plains because this is going to be in the coastal plain area of Tyre and Sidon. But essentially, it sounds very similar. Blessed are the poor, whether it's poor in spirit, poor in their ability to change their lives, or just poor, poor, theirs is going to be the kingdom of God. The hungry shall be satisfied. The, those who weep shall laugh. When people hate you or exclude you or revile you or spurn your name as evil, like, you know, they talk about it with such disgust of it as if it was evil. Because of the Son of Man, rejoice, for behold, your reward is going to be great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. These people, people in general, treated the prophets very poorly. And so it's going to be that. I was listening to an interesting podcast, which I'll put in the show notes, but it was talking about the Beatitudes and about the blessed R's. And there's a couple of ways blessed is used in the Bible, where you're saying, God bless me, put your blessings upon me, or you bless God, Baruch Atad and I, blessed are you, O Lord, where it's meant as a term of praise. In this case, when we're saying blessed, it means like fortunate. You know, someone said in the podcast, imagine you were the most blessed human being on the planet. You had the, le and they were all talking about the things, you know, you're in a tropical island and you have all the bananas you could ever want. And it's beautiful with beautiful, you are so blessed that no one could think of you as any more blessed. I mean, that's the kind of thing. And yet he's saying it to people who are poor and weep. And he's not telling us to be poor or start weeping. He is telling us that your world, you think the fortunate are the rich. You think are the fortunate are the happy. I'm going to tell you that no one is more fortunate than these people who are in sad conditions right now because their joy in the kingdom of God is going to be beyond anything. I think when you have nothing, you understand what it feels like to have nothing. When you have a lot, it's not quite that same feeling that you get when you get something more. So imagine a lottery winner, like a guy living on the streets, doesn't have a dime to his name, and suddenly he wins a lottery and he's a millionaire. His joy is so much greater because he had nothing. He didn't have food to feed himself. And a millionaire wins a lottery ticket and gets a million dollars. Probably doesn't care. Oh, that's cool. Got a million dollars, right? The really fortunate, the really blessed people on this earth are going to be those people who have nothing. No joy. They're hated. They're poor. They're hungry. They are going to be so blessed in heaven because they are going to get their reward there. Not that we're not going to get our reward there too, but you know what I mean? Feeling that you have. They are truly blessed individuals and people. It's remarkable how hard it is to talk about the Beatitudes. <laughs> that a lot of things are going on there and feelings and emotions that are in these blessings that we, I think, don't get in our world as readily as the people there would have heard it. And someone else points out in the commentaries that 
this isn't about salvation. You know, there's two kinds of images we get in the Bible. This is how you get to heaven. This is what saves you. But this is what makes you have the good life. This is what makes you fortunate. This is what matters the most. Not necessarily meaning this will get you to heaven, that this is going to get you saved. But instead, this is the way you should live your life, or this is the way you should treat other people. The Beatitudes in general are not a preaching of how to get to heaven. They are a preaching of how to live as a disciple, how to live as a follower of God. Someone else points out something kind of interesting, too, that said, in general, the way that these stories are ordered, Luke has a preference towards the chronological while Matthew was more of a pre- uh, presentation of themes. He had his, I think it was nine lessons, and he was putting it together as a lesson of a Jewish person, the prophecies, the fulfillments, and the how to live your life, while Luke is more writing a encyclopedia of the life and mission of Jesus. So while Matthew's, it said, Beatitudes on the Mountains, were more, there were nine Beatitudes. There are four here. But not only that, we're going to get to some woes. There are some people to be sorry for. Then says, woe to you who are rich, because you've received your consolation. You know, your prize is already here. Woe to you who are full. You, You know, you have things to eat, because you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh because you'll mourn and weep. Oh boy. And woe to you when people speak well of you, for their fathers spoke well of people who were false prophets. Which is really harsh. I mean, some of this you might say, well, why? Why is this? Why are you contrasting the poor from the rich? And obviously we know, and we've mentioned before, there were rich among Jesus' disciples, many of them that were clearly rich. There were people who were clearly full of joy, like Simeon, like Anna. They had joy at seeing the Lord. Those were people who laughed in the presence of Jesus. It's not an attack on people who have those things. It's more of an idea that when Luke is saying, woe to you or her rich, it's not that they're rich that is the problem. It is that they are satisfied. I don't have to go seeking the kingdom of God. I have everything I need right here. I can feed my family. We all laugh and sing. And we follow people who tell us the things we want to hear. I have no need of God's message in my life because I have everything I I want and I need right here. It's about dependence on God. He is calling out people who have stopped seeking the word of God, stopped seeking the counsel of true prophets of God, and instead feel like they have it all made. And we see that, you know, we see people who feel quite satisfied in what it is they have and where they are in life. They don't need anybody. You know, it makes me, I guess, think of in terms of like, you have the very rich in some places or you have the very famous in other places and they reject God because they already got the good life. They don't need anything else. I saw an interview that was talking about one particular woman who's a famous singer And how, in my mind, I was sad for her of how she was living her life. It was not how God intended us to live our lives. And yet she said in the interview, basically, nothing can go wrong. I'm living my best life. And I thought, gosh, you know, living for God, that's living the best life. Anytime you're going outside of that, you you aren't living your best life. You may think you are, but you're not. So that's kind of where I'm going with this is that I think he's saying, you think you're fulfilled now, but I'm telling you that this is actually woe. He also tells people to love their enemies and do good to those who hate you, that you should pray for people who abuse you, that if someone hits you on one cheek, you give them the other cheek, and if someone takes your cloak, give them your tunic too. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if someone steals from you or takes from you, don't demand it back. And this it says in ESV, as you wish that others would do to you, do also for them. Ooh. And if you just love people who love you back, well, what good is that? 
Everyone does that. Sinners do that. Everybody loves people who love them. If you do good things to people who do good things for you, well, so does everybody. But we're supposed to love our enemies, do good, lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. In Matthew, we talked a lot about forgive as though you want to be forgiven. Give mercy. Mercy is giving to people what they don't deserve as you would hope to get mercy from God. These are hard lessons, and these are hard, you know, I think for all of us. We see people beg. And in my opinion, I think that they should go to charities, you know, because the charities will be able to determine, are they taking drugs? Are they doing something to harm themselves? They'll be able to better care for people on the street than just giving someone money where they could buy drugs for it. (laughs) I'm confused on the whole issue. I'm more apt to say to give someone clothes or vouchers for food, or if someone were to take something of mine, of course I would take it back. It's mine, right? So again, these are hard lessons, I think, for us all to go through. We have to always forgive those people because God is forgiving those people. And it said right in here that he is kind to the ungrateful and evil, which is a hard lesson for us says that we shouldn't judge so that we won't be judged. We shouldn't condemn because we don't want to be condemned. We should forgive because we want to be forgiven, and we should want to give because we want to have things given to us. If we were poor and needed something, wouldn't we want someone to be kind to us? I mean, I know when I was very poor, people were kind to my family, and I would want that for other people as well. And then it says the hard thing, for the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. If you're stingy, stinginess will be returned, I think, to you. If you count every dime you give, every dime that you need, every mercy that you need will be counted back to you. Mm. Then he told him, it says a parable, can the blind man lead the blind? Won't they both fall into a pit? And that the disciple is not above his teacher. But when someone is fully trained, he'll be like his teacher. And we get back into the, if you condemn someone for a speck, a little tiny sliver in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log, the giant tree trunk in your eye, how can you say to your brother, get that speck out? You know, how can you condemn your brother? Because now you're a hypocrite. First, deal with your own log in your eye. And then you'll be able to see well enough to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So again, this isn't saying, as most people feel, and the way I've used it in the past, judge not lest thee be judged. You want to not be a hypocrite about it. It's okay for you to help your brother who has a problem, but don't have a bigger problem and think you're better than your brother. Go fix your bigger problem and then go help your brother. Being a hypocrite is the absolutely wrong way to go. We see hypocrisy all the time where you'll hear about pastors who will condemn certain people and then you find out they've been living a life in an entirely different way than they've been preaching. Hypocrisy is damaging to our church. It's damaging to that person. It's damaging to that person's brother. But in the end, the message is clear. We should treat other people how we want to be treated. We want to measure out to other people how we would want people to measure out to us. And then we get to the fig trees again. And it says that no good tree bears bad fruit and no bad tree does good fruit. That is, a tree is known by its fruit. And for figs, you don't get them from thorn bushes. (laughs) There's a difference. It's a bad tree. And grapes don't come from thorny bramble bushes. You get grapes from good grape vines. And just like that, a good person will produce good treasure from a good heart. And an evil person will produce evil treasure from their evil heart. What kind of heart that person has, his mouth will speak, I think, likewise. So we know from these messages of the fruit that when you do good things, when you have the right heart, When you are a good tree, 
good things will come from you, and that we will know other people by their fruit too. I heard another YouTube channel thing that was talking about a pastor who was basically saying, salvation is not just given to those people who have faith, but they have to produce good fruit too. And this is considered to be a heresy. It's the cart before the horse. Our faith in God is what gives us salvation, but because we have this faith in God, we will produce good fruit. We don't produce good fruit to buy our salvation. It's the God of the Romans. It's the God of the Greeks where we try to cajole and convince and demonstrate our dedicatedness so that we have the benefits of God. It's the other way around. God gives us salvation in the faith he gives us. We may reject it. We may say, I don't want to be anywhere near God, but we don't earn it. But because we have this faith and because God has asked us to live in a certain way, because we have that faith, we will now try to live a good life, to be kind, to be forgiving, to do the things that God asked us and to produce good fruit. We want to put this into the right order. And that's what this tree and fruit part is talking about. And then comes my very favorite parable, which is building your house on a solid foundation. If a person hears my words and then does them, it is like a man who builds his house, dug deep, laid a foundation on the rock. And when the floods rose and the stream broke against his house, nothing could be shaken of it because the house was so well built. But the one who hears the word of God and doesn't do any of those things, their house is without foundation and the stream will break it. So in this parable, this is where people are saying, you not only have to hear God's word, but you have to do what he says. I believe there is nothing you can do to earn your own salvation. However, it is wise of you, it is beneficial to you, to then hear those words and do something about it, to act upon it, to build your house on that strong foundation, to study the word of God like we're doing now. And that's what I think God is saying right here. We're not trying to build a strong foundation to earn our salvation. We're building a strong foundation because the God who built this earth, the God who built each and every one of us and wrote the owner's manual to it is telling us how to live and we should logically follow it because he knows everything about us. I think in this particular case, the, the um, parable is a little bit more vivid. It's about digging down deep and attaching to the foundation. And one of the commentaries said that this would be imagery that a Gentile would understand better than the parable writing in the book of Matthew. And that ends chapter six of Luke. Boy, what aren't I going to meditate about on this passage? But I do think that what struck me the most is this concern for the people who are poor, who ask for a tunic, who beg, who actually even go as far as to take something from you. Am I treating them in the way that God has asked me to do that? I'm, I'm having to think about that. And what I'm going to pray about is that he gives me the spirit to treat others in situations where they're poor, physically poor, poor in power, they have no ability to change their lives, or poor in spirit, where they're just downtrodden. What can I do to make their burden lighter and be more merciful towards them? And what I'm going to share with them is the fact that we all need God regardless of whether we are in the midst of poverty, in spirit, in power, or in reality, or we are rich and have everything going for us and everything going our way, we all need God in our lives. That's something to share with other people. Everybody, the rich and poor alike, should depend on God. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, I have a brand new podcast called Buzz, Blossom, and Squeak. I know it should have had a small step in there somewhere, but this is about going outside and discovering God's creation, one creature at a time. What can we learn more about this incredible world God has made for us? 